This is a test of the Bounty Park Alert System. Hello and welcome back to the Boundary Park Alert System with me, Matt Dean, and Andy Halliwell. Good morning, Andy. Morning, mate. You all right? Yeah, I'm good. We had no Easter pod, no pod after, just after Easter. We had a week off. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, it was nice, wasn't it? It was nice. It was, uh, you know, with the two games so close together like that, it's um, best just to sort of see how the whole thing pans out rather than uh than and trying to sandwich one in between so that was the that was the thinking behind it did you have a nice uh easter long weekend yeah well i mean apart from the football that ruined it <laughs> yeah obviously <laughs> yeah you yeah 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 it was good uh day out in altringham mm-hmm. uh, that was that was nice a few few pints um yeah but it was uh yeah, it was it was it was as we expected it to be. It wasn't the uh Easter six pointer that we were hoping for. Uh oh never mind. But anyway, so we thought this morning there's only me and you on. Uh we've got no fan guest uh, this week. So what we thought we'd do is we've never actually answered the fan guest questions ourselves, have we? No. So no. we'll do it today. Uh, and you can ask me. Uh, I'm going to do Lattice Mind as well. So I'll be the official fan guest today. When was respect. your first game, Matt? I've no idea, Andy, specifically. But I'll tell you, um, it was. There's a cluster of matches that I remember from round about 1987, I think. Something like that. I, I remember going to some league games against Grimsby Town, Shrewsbury Town, Bradford. At Boundary Park. I remember when we played Tottenham um, in the FA Cup when I think Gary Lineker, it, and, Yeah, I remember that game and Everton were there as well around about 87, I, I think. I don't I don't think Lineker played from it. It was uh, Chris Waddle and Ozzy Ardiles that ran. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't remember, but I remember uh, being impressed because yeah. um, you know, it was it was a big team, loads of famous faces in there. And and then I remember going to like Stoke away and Blackburn away with school. Um, we played matches in in those towns with the school team, and then went to the games after. So I, I don't remember specifically which game it was. It was just around about that time. Um, yeah, so one of them. My, my my first game was on the sixth of December, nineteen eighty six, uh, and it was at home against Shrewsbury Town, and we won three nil. Could that could have been mine? I, for all I know, I said one of the games was Shrewsbury, but I I, I don't remember. I tell you what, I remember though that, that it was it's the things that stand out, Andy. I don't, do you remember that little rascal van that used to drive around on the pitch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With the girl in the back waving. Yeah. <laughs> it was stuff like that. It was just like was the, there, there was a tea trolley, wasn't there as well? <laughs> yeah, the tea trolley. <laughs> yeah, and it was just. It, yeah, I mean, how do you remember the date, by the way? Do, we, do you have a program or does? Yeah, I've got you know... got a program. Yeah, yeah. So I know, yeah. I know, I know the exact game it was. And my 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 old man, uh, my my late father, he he was a, he was a City fan, and so you know, and I'm from Manchester, I'm not from Oldham. He was from Middleton, so I should really, by rights, be be a City fan. And that's when you remember when when Barry Owen did his bit of research on. Uh, yeah, on yeah. my family and started seeding stuff that we, he'd, he'd yeah. worked out because my dad was a copper that, that he'd be a City fan and he just made an assumption. I, I've, yeah. I actually got a half-brother that's a City fan and he got the wrong one. Um, well, look, the, got... there's there's the theory amongst the flat earthers that, that I only started becoming an older fan within the last four years or five oh, no. years or something like that as well. <laughs> you know, his conspiracy theories, you know. Mad, right. isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I remember my old man took me to uh, – he wouldn't take me to – main road in the early 80s because the, the hooliganism was his excuse yeah. um so i went to like tour de tame side and then rochdale and berry and places like that and then he and he took me to latix this day and i, I don't know why but that that was it i walked in i was like this is it I'm staying here i'm home yeah <laughs> that was it there was, yeah, I think was there was just a sort of like a, a charm about it or something about it that just was a bit sort of captivating i suppose i think because i remember my dad taking me to old trafford to watch a united game um and i just remember how unimpressed i was by the whole thing because it, it i don't know it just felt like 
felt, I don't know, impersonal, I think it was. I just felt like just somebody else just in the crowd. And, and at Boundary Park, you just felt, it just was just like, this is rubbish. I'm not into this. I like Boundary, this is Boundary Park is where it's at, you know. Like, it just felt like, like you said, it just felt right. There was just a lot more quirkiness about it. And, and, and yeah, I loved it. I loved the Chaddy end. Like, being in the Chaddy end was just the best thing. And, um, yeah, so, you know, I was hooked like you were. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we are. Yeah, uh, who was your first favourite player? So my first, so the first, my first memories of football are uh, really getting into football was the nineteen eighty six World Cup, and so like my first favourite players were like Gary Lineker and Brian Robson. Like they were my first two like favourite footballers that I remember having, and I think it's probably from that point then in in nineteen eighty six when I was eight that I really. I mean, I always played football, but started getting into football and, you know, like, say, going to Latics and stuff like that. The first Latics player I remember really like, he was Tommy Wright because um, he was, like, fast winger. Um, so I think I think Tommy Wright, I, th I used to like his song as well. Tommy, Tommy Wright, you know, when he gets that ball. He gets the ball, the scores. Tommy Wright. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so I think I think Tommy Wright was my first. I don't think it lasted. I think, I think it be rapidly became... It was such a hard time to pick a favourite player because you used to love them all. I used to love Andy Rich, I used to love Roger Palmer. So, but yeah, first one was Tommy Wright. Yeah, my mum was Roger Palmer. He was, he was my favourite player. Um, I just, I just used to love the fact that he would, he would, uh, how his movement, he just lose his marker all the time and then find space. And so, you, whenever it came to, whenever the ball came across to him, you just, you knew he was gonna, he was gonna find five yards of space and. And he wasn't he wasn't the quickest necessarily, and he, he didn't have the great. He, he didn't even connect with the ball very very cleanly often. But he just guided it, and that was brilliant. Loved it. You know um, what? While you're saying that, Andy, what makes me think about Andy Ritchie's uh, not Andy Ritchie, Roger Palmer. His kind of personality, he kind of played football like his personality. You know, very quiet, unassuming. If you you were kept because people used to say about him ghosting in, like you know, you could kind of it was like people could forget he was there because he was so quiet, so subtle, but obviously really intelligent and you know really understated, but 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 lethal as 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 a player. So yeah, he, he was one of those players that kind of carried his personality onto the pitch, seemingly. Yeah, yeah. What's your uh, f favorite Latics related memory? Well, you mentioned Main Road and the hooliganism and stuff. The, the Man United semi-final at Main Road was like nothing I'd ever seen in my life. It was insane. Like like I said before, like seeing players like it was the first time I saw a player like Brian Robson in the flesh, you know, you know, Mark Hughes, like it was up close and personal as well, like clinging to the railings in the is the Kipax in it that was down the side. Side, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I were in the small bit of the Kipax. All those like frothing, raging, lunatic Man United fans to the right hand side. I just remember them. I remember how angry and horrible they were, clinging to the railing. All the Latics fans, all the noise. Uh, I remember the size of players like Brian Robson and Mark used thighs. They were massive. I just remember looking at because he had the short shorts on, and you were up close, and you were thinking, Jesus, and how strong they were, and how, how, how much they tried to bully and intimidate our our players, and how good we were <laughs> on the day. Like it was just, and the game itself, like three all. It was just like, I don't know. It was just the the most. Um, it, it was just like an assault on the senses. It was like the football equivalent of going to India, really. It was just like everything about it was just like, you know. And I went to Wembley and for the League Cup final. And obviously, that was really special. But like that that day at, that, at Main Road was just like insane. It was just something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, I mean, there's loads of memories over that time. But that, that was the, that whole day probably was the, the the best day. You know, it was boiling hot. Uh, it was a afternoon game keeping around the palace liverpool game in the morning and uh it, for me i'd have been like 13 going to a school in tameside just surrounded by united fans and city fans a handful of Oldham fans not very many um and and then giving you know giving me jip all week 
And then us absolutely taking them to the cleaners nearly in that game. Me walking back into school on Monday just going, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not so gobby now, are you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was pretty special, yeah. Um, and, the fact, and the fact that I was going as well, like season ticket, going to all the games, and you've got all these armchair United and City fans who don't actually go every week. And you're like, well, we, you know, and then when they won the replay and you're like, well, were you there? No, well, shut up then. Because <laughs> I was, you know, so it was, uh, yeah, that was pretty... Pretty special day, wasn't it? Almost yeah, but it was like equally heartbreaking time. losing, wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the thing. One of my favourite like non-football related Latics memories is when we went to Sheffield Wednesday, with, uh, me and my brother and my mate Gaz, and we were drinking on the train. Uh, I think we managed to get through a whole bottle of vodka between Oldham and Sheffield, which was, you know, not, not bad going. Um, but somehow my brother ended up with a kite, and uh, he tried to take the kite into the game, but they wouldn't let him. Uh, obviously, uh, well, not obviously. We were trying to it was like, why well, is only a kite? You know, not that we'd be able to fly it. Like there was no wind or anything in there. But uh, and then he insisted on getting it back off the coppers at the end of the game. <laughs> so that was really funny. We were stood outside Hillsborough, um, Simon arguing to get this kite back, uh, and he got it back. And we were there for ages, and it was just like ridiculous. But I, I, the, the, there's so many of those little little things that 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 stand out. The funny things. We we once took a load of uh, Yorkshire puddings on wires to Barnsley, and we had flat caps on, and we. We were walking around with Yorkshire puddings like they were little dogs. And we were, <laughs> we were going up to people in Barnsley, oh, he likes you, he likes you. And we were just like about to walk into this uh, pub in Barnsley. And um, the lads on the door just looked at us and went, lads, you know, the well, coppers, I think it were, actually, set them off and uh, walk in the other direction as quickly as possible because <laughs> you're going to get your heads kicked in. And then we realised, really, that we were taking the piss, you know, quite, uh, quite a lot. But... Yeah, there's so many of those kind of like drunken day away day, like tomfoolery kind of memories that you just, even though we've been bobbins that whole time, you just wouldn't, you just wouldn't trade it for anything. Like it's just what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. We've got a little unknown fact about yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have actually. Um, I was, I appeared to, as on. Um, do you remember Keith? You won't remember it because nobody does. Keith and Orville's Quack Chat Show. <laughs> no <laughs> no well keith harrison orville had a, had a tv show called the quack chat show um which was on bbc one and our school got we got invited down twice to like to be on it so i got gunged on uh you remember when gunging was a thing in the in the 80s get under a big bucket of slime and gunge like right? so i got gunged on a on a t- kids tv show that was that was fun. Got, got a video of it <laughs> I think my, I think my mum might have it on video somewhere downstairs. I I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. So there you go. Um, what about you? I, I've I've done something before, like over the over the like uh, I, when I first moved to London, which was in the late nineties. I used to. Uh, it just bear in mind this is the day before smartphones or anything like that. Um, I used to pretend because I've got red hair and my surname's Halliwell. That was Jerry Halliwell's cousin. So I used to blag my way into uh, exclusive London nightclubs on the premise that she was coming down there. We needed a table. <laughs> <laughs> so it did work, did it? Yeah, n- not every time. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I've done that. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you another little anecdote, which is Latics related. I remember going to, uh, I think I've told you this before, but probably not on the pod. Um, I went to the Football Writers Awards dinner. So I work in advertising. I got invited by a supplier to this this do at Lancaster Gate. I remember the year. It was 2004, so 20 years ago. And um, I'm at this event, and I'm sat on this, you know, uh, black tie dinner. Football writers, I think Thierry on we run, won the Football Writers Player of the Year or whatever. And this everyone's in there. Cause it's Arsene Wenger's there. Sir Alex Ferguson's there. Um uh, Terry Venables is there. Everyone's there, uh, and on our table was the supplier was a Tottenham fan. So we had like Keith Burke and Shaw sat on our table, and saw sort of Tottenham people and whatever. And I'm obviously just looking around the auditorium. Absolutely huge hall, you know. Everyone there from from uh, all the newspapers and TV and everything. And I'm just looking around trying to find anyone with a Latex connection. Couldn't see a soul, not a single soul uh, there that I could find. And then all of a sudden, I saw David Sheepshanks walk past me. He was involved in the FA at the time, and he, at that point, he was chairman of uh, Ipswich Town. 
And at that at that time, Joel Royal was manager of Ipswich Town. So I was thinking to myself, well, if David Cheapshanks is there, Joel Royal's got to be knocking about somewhere. So I basically followed him, got behind David Cheapshanks and just like, you know, stalked him to the back of this auditorium. And, and he went into this really small sort of back room away from the main event. And in this back room, it had a little bar in the corner and it had a couple of tables and sat on this table with what I assume was the board, board of directors of Ipswich Town Football Club. And Joe Royal sat at the back of the table. And then, so I got myself a drink, quick drink, bit of Dutch courage, and then just went up to the table and, you know, and interrupted them. I was like, excuse me, sorry, you know, can I have a word, Joe? I'm a, I'm a Latics fan. It'd be quite nice to have a chat to you. And he got up from the table, right, excused himself, grabbed me by the arm, walked me to the bar, sat down on two stools, bought me a pint, and then I sat there for 20 minutes just nattering about Latics to him. Brilliant. Nice. Lovely yeah. man. <laughs> what a gent, eh? Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Now, you were probably just waiting for an excuse to get off that table, Andy, and you just turned up straight away. It's like, bingo, here we go. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about latex. It's much yeah. better. Stick and talk about it. I actually remember one of the things I said to him, just to, to come back to the uh, favourite latex related memory as well, is I said to him, I distinctly remember saying, when when did you think we were at our peak? Like in your in the years that you where, where were we at our absolute best? Because I, I, I've always thought maybe the, in the first division season in 91, 92, we were probably at our best then in that season. That's, that would be my view. And he, he said the FA Cup semi final against United in 1990 was literally our. Nadia, in mm -hmm. his opinion, that it, that was the absolute best, and, mm -hmm. and, he, and he's like, I know we didn't win it, but that was when we were at our best. And well, that when Ferguson would back that up, one he said that Oldham were the best team he played that season, that season. yeah, in, you know, in that game. So it's fair enough, I think it's probably true. On Saturday, 18th of May, we proudly present Trophy Chairs. The second annual Boundary Park Alert System Awards and end of season party. At last year's event, we presented Big Mark Bond up with his Goal of the Season Award and Joe Yarny with his Player of the Year Award. But who will win these coveted awards this year? Make sure you're there at the Cotton Rooms in Oldham at what Saintsy Dave describes as... A potentially star-studded potential promotion event. With music from fantastic live band The Rays, the Latix Mind Final, interactive games, varying quality prizes and all the usual nonsense. Last year's event sold out so grab your tickets now from ofcpodcast.co.uk forward slash shop to avoid disappointment. Tickets cost just £20 and this includes a very tasty pie supper. Mm, don't miss Trophy Chest! Well, we've done tremendously well, Andy, to get to, we've got to like 17 minutes in and we've barely <laughs> even talked about the um, football at all. I think what we'll do before we actually talk about the Rochdale game is uh, we'll bring this um, and sort of linked into that um, memory because obviously somebody, a player who played for Oldham in that game but then went on to play for Man United was Dennis Irwin and he was at Boundary Park yesterday. All right, sexy day from the Oldham podcast with uh, one of the all-time legendary right-backs, not just of the Premier League, but of Oldham Athletic, Mr Dennis Irwin. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. What have you been up to, mate? Uh, I'm still working away, doing bits and pieces, um, both for myself and, and for the club. Um, so I can't complain, life is good. Uh, obviously, you, you, you were 12 years at United for a long time. You were probably the best right-footed left-back I've ever seen in my life. Um, you're a bit... Bit too uh, early for me in your Latics <laughs> days, but have you been keeping your eye on the events of Oldham over the last few years? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I only ever played for four clubs when, uh, since I came across to Ireland, and I always keep an eye on them four. Uh, I had a fantastic four years here uh, between '86 and '90, um, during Oldham's glory days, and um, play with under a great manager who I who I've actually met today at today's game. Um, Joe Royal and a, a great squad of players and a great backroom team Willie Donachy and a lot um, so I have very fond memories of the four years I had here and it actually helped me an awful lot when I did move to Manchester United it made me more mature um, you know the way I played under Joe it was similar to the way I played under Sir Alex very attacking what, it always encouraged me to get forward uh, and, and cross the ball as often as possible and I had a good couple of decent players outside me and Roger Palmer when I first came and then Neil Adams so uh, it helped me an awful lot here so I have very fond memories Who taught you free kicks then? Was it Tricky Ricky Alden or was it, was it, was it a natural gift? No, I, I, taught, I taught Tricky Ricky <laughs> I was here before him uh, 
No, I think it's one of them that's kind of, you've always got that. You just yeah. practice it to make it, make, make it better. You're, ne- you're never going to make it perfect, make it better. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, was, I, worked in the, I played in a plastic pitch here for four years, so I think that, that helped me as well, um, get a ball up and down. And also helped me the fact that I had uh, Andy Ritchie and, and Bunny um, who made my bad balls into good balls, whether it was a, from a free kick or a corner or whatever, um, they helped me enormously. Uh, the, the one thing I've seen from my dad's videos of Alden back in the day is that on, on the plastic, you did put your tackles in, but you never seemed to slide, or and when you got tackled, you never seemed to go down. Uh, it was, it was that just a bit of a bit of streetwise sort of stuff? Because no, that pitch was out. I, I think you learned very quickly that if you went to ground, um, you, were, you were stuck with a, a graze for the rest of the season. Um, no, it was a matter of... Um, uh, shielding players more or less because um, it helped us I suppose yeah, in the yeah. fact that especially the first 20 minutes in games because <laughs> um, teams didn't know how to tackle uh, the pitch but you know we were well accustomed to it um, hence I suppose why the, the more direct you are in getting the ball forward and the quicker um, uh, and have, uh, hence having Andy Ritchie and, and Bunny up there up top it helped us enormously so we knew how to play Dennis Thank you for your time. No it's, been great. it's been great. Uh, and hopefully get you on the podcast soon, eh? Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Cheers. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what, Dennis sounded uh, an articulate man, didn't he? Um, I mean, if we just got... We're, we're reminiscing a bit here now because because of that again. But <laughs> you see, my my memory... I, I mean, I remember all, all of that era, really. Um you, he, he said there we got the ball forward quickly. You kind of link that to... The, we're doing that now under Mellon, right? We we are definitely getting the ball forward at, at, at pace. Hoof ball is the way of looking at it. We never played hoof ball under Royal. No. Never. That wasn't the way he played. Uh, uh, he did get the ball forward quickly, but it was always with a view to picking up the second ball, getting it wide and getting it in the box. So, we, you know, the, the whole wingers, we haven't got any wingers in the team now, have we? Not, I mean, no. Devon Green is, is our only winger, um, really, and it, he's a bit powder puff and, and has been injured a lot this season. But we, I've got no problem with getting the ball forward at pace if, if the objective is to pepper the, the box with crosses and try and pick up the second ball. We just don't pick up the second ball, do we? Yesterday, again, we just didn't pick the second ball up very well, you know? We, we we just yeah. It's about having a, a being well drilled and having a way of playing, isn't it? And 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 you know, under Joe Royal, it was really effective of how we played because that's obviously how the you know you well, first of all you build a squad of players, um, a small squad of players as it was then. You know, you, you two subs on a bench, really same players playing week week in week out, and. Um, you know, they just get used to playing together. They get used to playing a certain way, and and, and they learn how to to make it happen. <sighs> yes, the, what one, yes, what one of, one of the other things to know is that again, you, if you think of any Latics team that's been any good, and there aren't many <laughs> uh, in the last thirty years, we have all often always had width. So Andy Liddell, David Ayres, you know, cracking winger. I mean, I like Josh Low. I thought Josh Low was a was a cracking winger as well. Um, you know, Rick Holden, uh, Neil Adams, or whatever. We always had width. Don't have any width at the minute. And I know the modern game doesn't really sort of account for it as much, but we it's it, we just end up being too narrow, don't we? Yeah, you still you still need people to put crosses in. Putting crosses in and, and balls in is is still important. You know, Andy Little was always you know a good delivery from the right. David, uh, people like that. Like what we, you've got to have that ability. I mean, yesterday. So the way we set up yesterday was. Four one four one, yeah. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that formation because I think it it encourages the team to play higher up the pitch. Uh, it did yesterday with with guys sit sort of in the middle and Lundstrom and Gardner were the two they were the outstanding players on the pitch yesterday for Latte. Thought they both played well, and their job is to get up closer to Norwood. But the problem we did yesterday is we we did have width. We had hope and. I know, but, um, but, he said, Dallas, but but they were playing high and wide up the pitch as opposed to further back and wide up the pitch. And and, and all that did was isolate, at times, Norwood in the middle when um, Lundstrom and Gardner weren't pushing on. And 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 they weren't getting the ball, Dallas and, and Hope, and, and doing anything with it. So it, it wasn't working. But I, th- I, I thought, I think that based on, we were talking about the formation you see during the game and stuff, and it's, it, it, yeah, it, 
it, it can, I can understand the working of it. The problem we've got at the minute, Andy, we talked about all season is because we haven't got the right place to play in the right positions, he's constantly trying to sort of like tinker and do things that he thinks might work uh, in the hope that they will. But if you've got, say, three key players, three key three key positions where you've got players out of position in the team, it's really we're, going to ham, you know, really going to we, hamstring we, we, the team. We had four. We had four yesterday. So you've got Will Sutton, a centre-back, playing at right-back. Mm. You've got Harrison Maguire, a centre-back, playing in midfield. Mm -hmm. You've got Hallam Hope, a forward, playing as a winger. Yeah. And then you've got Dallas, a centre-forward, yeah. in theory, or a forward, playing as another winger. Yeah, you're not. You're not gonna. It's. I mean, when it comes back to recruitment. I did. Did you? Did you listen to Mickey Mellon's um, sort of pre-match, thirteen-minute interview prior to the game? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, it was yeah. Um, very, very flat. I. Like, I mean, I thought that. I thought that was. I thought that was probably the strangest interview to date um, because what was the word he used? Inherited for the first time. So. Yeah. For me, this he's dem for me that that's signalling displeasure at, at the squad, and he's definitely had enough for some of them, um, for sure. Um, but then he's bemoaning the fact that we haven't got a right back because Sack Dev is a right wing back, <laughs> and he won't play him at right back therefore because he's a wing back. But you'll play Will Sutton there, um, yeah. And then Walker, you know, he's not ready for first team football. But he's yeah. he signed these players. He it was a little bit. I found it a bit strange. It was it was um, he was he was basically complaining, wasn't he? He was a, he was complaining about what he's got available to him and the fact that he can't do much with it, um, and and explaining that really is as the reason why we've had a shocking run through March and April so far, and and you know pretty much blown it. Um, but you know some of these players he signed. I, the other thing I, I want to say is is Terry McPhillips is the I just don't know whether he's still interim or or, or or whether he's even still here. I don't know. But he was recruited as interim uh, head scout or head of recruitment to work with the, the scouts that are, that have been in, that were employed by Steve Thompson. Now, my understanding is that Terry McPhillips was a recommendation of uh, Gary Brabin and uh, Mickey Mellon. He's got Southport connections, which Brabin had. Um, so this is somebody who the, that they know and work with. It's not someone who's been plucked in by the club and dropped into there a bit like you might argue Steve Thompson was um, and, and David Unsworth were, were sort of Steve Thompson were not connected in any way. So it's not like they've got to build a relationship from scratch. They in theory have got one. Um, and so bemoaning the players that have been signed and saying, well, Sack Dev's not right back and Walker's not really ready first team football. You're like, well, you signed him, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I felt that, I felt a bit odd. I think it, I mean, it begs the question, well, why don't you give some of our younger players some first team experience rather than bringing in loan players that aren't ready or you don't feel that, you know, are suitable? That doesn't really seem, doesn't really make any sense, does it? It's kind of yeah. like, well, we'll give, we'll give them a go, see if they're ready. Presumably it's like, we'll give them a go or they're not ready. Well, okay. But <laughs> you need to know that, I mean, I know you might say, well, you take loan players on, they're not going to necessarily be ready. Really, you need to be taking loan players on that are ready, or that. But the problem is, is that they're not going to be sending on loan players. Are not going to be who are ready, and not necessarily going to come down to the national league. So we're in that. You know, why not blood some of that youth from our own ranks instead? Yeah, I mean, you know, as, as much as David Unsworth's reputation has been um, quartered at Latics, he 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 did say would would some sort of sense that it's difficult uh, in the fifth tier to get loan players that are ready, which is why he, he didn't, or he couldn't attract them. I guess the counter argument to that is Bromley seemed to do all right when they put loan players out from places, you know, um, then they've, they've always got one or two that, that do well for them. So I guess it depends upon what your scouting is like. And, and this is really one of the things we should talk about is during the summer, it would be great for us to sit down with the likes of, uh, you know, someone from the board, maybe Darren Royal again, so over a year and a year and a bit now since we spoke to him last, uh, and maybe um, Mickey Mellon if he'll come on, or or someone from the some of the coaching staff, just to understand how uh, we're going to improve upon on the recruitment. Because you know, like, like we said before, everything off the pitch is is fantastic. The the structure is great. You know, Mickey Mellon's appointment is is well reasoned. There's no reason to be disappointed with anything that's going on at the club, other. <laughs> 
than the recruitment of footballers has probably been the thing that's that's really let us down this season. So next summer uh, or the summer coming, we've really got to get that right if we stand any chance of getting out of this division next year. Because you know, I'm, I've I've resigned ourselves to to uh, to being here next year. So um, we probably need to understand that a bit more. And, understand how the, the stats are working you know we've got stats bomb there's i think there's only a handful of clubs in the league that have got it us and york for sure i'm not, not sure whether bromley have got it um and how that's being used how the scouting nets works being used just to understand it a little bit more because we've got to get that right this summer and we've got to make sure that we put round pegs in round holes next season haven't we yeah i, I like i've said it before uh, reading between the lines and some of the stuff that melon had said about see, knowing what it take, knowing what a footballer looks like, um, that maybe he doesn't necessarily favour the, and in you know the stats bomb method entirely. I think there's you know there's there's a, there's a certain amount of you know stats don't give you the kind of instinct and learned eye that you might gather over an amount of time when it comes to footballers and and, and spotting potential and things like that. So yeah, I think I think. When when Unsworth came in, it was with an eye of a, a manager coming in. All right, he didn't he wasn't he didn't have a proven track record at first team level, but he would worked with a lot of young players. It was with a view of bringing through young players, three and a half year deal, building a, a foundation within a football club, a methodology, how to play, all that kind of stuff. And it just didn't pan out, did it? It didn't work or whatever, you know. Um, Mellon seems to be a different type of an appointment, uh, a kind of get us out quicker, but he can't get us out quicker with the same players that failed under Unsworth. And, you know, he, he's going to need time. Now, we're already getting to that stage now where people want Mellon out. <laughs> That's just, you know, where you're at. Because at the end of the day, we've we've ended the season as badly as we started it, arguably with a better squad of players. So you could argue that David Unsworth is getting more out of a, a worse squad than, than Mellon is. So it, it just leaves that kind of, like, ambiguity. I think... From from Darren Royal's point of view, or from his role as a CEO, I think he's been copying some flack on social media because I think there's a little bit of a grey area in terms of how much his what his role is involved in recruitment, and that can potentially jeopardise his work that he's doing off the field as a CEO. And there's an argument to suggest that those two roles shouldn't cross over, and that. A director of football, somebody you know, entirely related to football, deals with the football side of things, with the with the coaching staff and the football management and all that, and then the off field stuff is dealt with separately, so that there isn't a kind of a crossover where somebody like Darren could come in with some flack. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily the case. I'm saying that that's the perception, and that that perception is potentially damaging um, to Darren's reputation. Because of his, you know, his involvement with the stat stuff and all this kind of thing. Do you, do you think? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's something I, we can talk to him about. Hmm. But do you think that that's a valid point, or, or that's just my reading of the way that some fans are taking it? So, what, what do you think about? Yeah, that? but I, 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 I just think there's, um, I, I, that you, you, you're right. That is how some are reading it. It's not how I read it. I, we, we spoke to him and interviewed him in November of 2022, and he explained to us what the what the premise behind it was. And and if you if you repeat what from memory he said was that the, the stats product is there to cast a wide net. So if you're looking to fill a particular position with a certain type of footballer to fit a certain type of style of play, then the, the stats product can, can cast that wide net within your addressable market. So at our level, addressable market probably is regionally based because you're not going to necessarily attract people from the south to move north, not with ease anyway, unless you pay them a lot of money, which you can't do every player. Um you, you, you're going to be within your addressable market and those people that that, that, that have got the skills or the, or the stats to match. But then what you do is you send your scouts out to do the quality control bit. So yeah. he, he talked about that in the interview. And that quality control is supposed to then, uh, stats are telling you one part of the story. They go out and watch the players themselves with their eye, their trained eye, and maybe they speak to, the, to people that know the player to understand the character. Uh, and they do a bit of research on them, and then they, re, you know, they, they pull a report on them, and they send them to the to the head of recruitment. The head of recruitment then talks to their scouts, and the head of recruitment then talks to to the to the first team manager, and then they decide which of those that they want to want to discuss 
to, to sign. There shouldn't be any problem with having the, the, the stats products. All it's going to do is add information which you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, and so it should give us an advantage. It should not be a disadvantage. Now, Darren's role in all of that is he just comes from that, that space. He worked in, in stats in sport before, which should give us another added advantage in as much as he knows how to use it, how to get the best out of it, so we can provide some advice. I've met Darren a few on a few occasions now. I, I don't know him well. I think I understand his character a bit. He's not the sort of gentleman who's going to impose his view and opinion on a professional. He's going to give his opinion and then leave it to the professional to make the decisions. He's not that sort of bloke. So I I'm, I don't believe that Darren's having any sort of influence over the players that sign. And that's why that interview that, that um, Mellon gave before the weekend, I thought, was a... I'm not going to say it was disingenuous because it, I don't know the background, but I found it a little bit uh, puzzling on the basis that these players were signed by the head of recruitment that you and Brabin wanted, Mellon, is my understanding, and it's not enforced upon you by anybody else. I don't imagine I Darren I think he's Royal... only signed seven, though, hasn't he, out of a squad of 32. So, I mean... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of players there that he... You know, 30, 25 players there that he's had no say over recruitment of. And, you know, all right, he, he made a couple of loan signings that didn't really work out. We, you know, we've got the likes of Conlon, who's yet to hit the ground running, uh, Garner, Dallas, who I think, I mean, looking at Dallas player, you can say that he's had injuries, he's been played out of position, but it's hard to see what all the fuss was about with that fella. Um, unlucky yesterday, he had a shot at the post, took a deflection. I'm sure that would have done his confidence the world to go if that had gone in. So, I, I, you know, there's obviously a player in there. He's he, he's signed for a League One club. I, it's it's I think what I think we're at that point again where because things haven't gone the way that everybody wanted them to go, people start pointing fingers. People start putting blame. Who's to blame for this? This is like this season has been disappointment. We should have finished in the playoffs. We we got ourselves into the playoff situation. We made additions to the squad, and yet we've not achieved our goal, barring some kind of a miracle starting on Wednesday night at Halifax. Now because it's gone wrong, people start pointing fingers. They start, you know, who's, who's, is it um, Mellon's fault? If it's not Mellon's fault, is it the player's fault? If it's not the player's fault, is it the board's fault? Is it Darren's fault? Is it whose fault is it? And everyone needs the pound of flesh, don't they? We can't keep going round in these circles where we're all pointing fingers at everybody. I, I, I think that, you know, Unsworth, people wanting Unsworth out is out. So we wanted a new manager in, we've got a new manager in. People bemoan the fact that Unsworth had no experience, so they signed an experienced manager. The experienced manager doesn't necessarily play the kind of football that people want them to play, so then that's an issue. And um, they want it to so they say it's okay if it's not attractive football as long as it's effective football. It's not effective yet. So but we have to go into the summer, we have to go into next season with some kind of consistency. You're talking there about the recruitment staff, the, the, the head of recruitment, the coaches, all this. If without any kind of consistency, we'll just get into a cycle of never actually achieving anything and never actually getting a squad uh, that, that is balanced because it's built by the same person to put the right uh, shaped pegs in the right shaped holes. So we have to go into next season with that level of consistency, which completely just writes off melon being removed at this stage because that would just be ridiculous since we started in 2020 the boundary park alert system podcast has evolved we were initially a weekly podcast then we launched the latix football phone in our weekly youtube live stream and most recently our saturday morning look at latix show on oldham community radio three different shows on three different platforms we also produce a popular weekly blog, manage multiple social media accounts and host live events. A lot to manage and it's fair to say we are not simply a fan podcast anymore. We're a multimedia fan channel dedicated to Oldham Athletic. So from the start of the 24-25 season, we are excited to announce that our home at oafcpodcast.co.uk will become weareoldham.co.uk. Our shows will remain the same, but our output will be delivered under a new brand, We Are Oldham, dedicated fan media. This new structure will help us to manage our output, develop new ideas and grow with your help. Our team is small. You all know Andy, Arlene, Sexy Dave and me, Matt. 
but we love to bring more of you on board and help us reach as many fans as possible by creating the content that is relevant to them. As well as our new website, we're on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram and Facebook. So there are lots of opportunities for additional short and long form content that we don't have time to produce currently. If you're a content creator, if you want to be a host, a producer, an interviewer, or if you're a graphic designer, design merchandise, you're a writer, a photographer, event organiser, whatever it is, then please get in touch and let us know how you'd like to be involved. There are two caveats though. One, you must be a dedicated Latix fan. And two, no time wasters. We've worked hard to build up our channel through being reliable and consistent, so you'll need to be the same. Please get in touch via the contact page on our website, oafcpodcast.co.uk, if you'd like to talk about being involved in this exciting new project. We are old and dedicated fan media. Now, Melon has got a massive summer coming up and a big season next season. I think he's got enough good players in that squad to make a team out of with the right number of signings and getting rid of a number of players. I think that the board are learning a lot of lessons very, very quickly. But the owners are learning a lot of lessons about the amount of money that goes in. How to, They're going to have to be a lot more... They're going to have to use that money a lot more effectively because there's been a lot of wasted money, I think, on, on, on players over the last couple of years. But again, the, these are things that happen. It's like when people are casting blame... Really annoys me. People have got to find someone to blame, and 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 things happen. People make mistakes. People do things with the best intentions. Let's just trust that things are going to become better. That that that, that the creases will get ironed out, and that the right players will be brought in next season. I think next season, Andy, top six all season needs to be our goal. We need to be in the top six all season. I think, like you said before, there's going to be a number of teams that are competing next season. I don't think Latics are going to be runaway leaders. I don't think we've invested anywhere near the amount of money that the likes of Notts County, Wrexham, Stockport and Chesterfield have done over a prolonged period of time to get them to the, the point, you said before about when Latics were at the peak of their powers. You know, those five teams all got to the peak of their powers and then went on and got promoted, but it took them a while to get there. So we're not, we're not just going to go in and just become champions of of this division. We, you said on the podcast the other week, it takes an average of five seasons. Well, we're going into our third season next season. I suspect we're going to be one of those top six challenging clubs next season. And that I think, again, that is movement in the right direction. We're not throwing money at it like Wrexham have or like Stockport did. And Stockport didn't throw all the money at it all in one go. They built themselves up to it to the point where they were, you know, ready to win the league and move on. And now, you know, they're moving on up into League One. So it's all about this thing about temporary expectations. And it's been difficult for us week in, week out to keep commenting on it, to be trying to look ahead into the future, try and remain calm. We, we both had our, our wits end <laughs> and we're looking forward to the season to be over. It's hard. It really is hard for us all uh, to just keep having to sort of swallow that patience pill and just keep waiting for it to work because <laughs> it's uh it is taking its time but I've, i still i'm still confident despite everything that we are moving in the right direction i think we've re i think we have i think the players have let us down this season if i'm honest um you could argue that the manager's not been tactically brilliant and that worries some fans for for next season but we're going to have to give him a summer we're going to have to give him a chance to to fix this squad in a way that he thinks it can work because he has done it before and we have to take some solace from that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with all that. Yeah. He, and he needs to find a, a way of playing next season that, that, that means we're effective. Um, and if that's getting the ball forward quickly, so be it. Um, you know, I, like, it's a bit like watching Rock, Rochdale walking it out from the back yesterday and I said, I'll take the goal kicks for him and trying to be Pep Guardiola City, weren't they? And, you know, I, I, that's just as daft probably at this level because they're not those players aren't aren't up to it. But we've got to find an identity, haven't we? And, and then try and play to it. So yeah, well, look at, I mean, looking at what, what we've got, Andy. Looking at just look on that question though about identity and way of playing. Looking at what we've got and the types of players we have and the types of players we need to bring in. What is that identity for you? Well, you kind of. If we just talk about, uh, when we, we, I don't want to get into the squad part because we'll do this in a couple of weeks' time, but um, 
James Norwood, for me, is our best player. But people bemoan him all the time, moaning about him yesterday and, and what have you, you know, attitude and doesn't affect enough games and all that sort of stuff. James Norwood is a is a 18-yard box footballer. He comes alive in the box. And if you create chances for him, nine times out of ten, he'll hit the target and a significant proportion of those will probably go in. You can't expect James Norwood to pick the ball up 30 yards out and drive at defenders. So that's not his game. So... We need to find uh, some players that can run with the ball um, and, you know, stretch the play a little bit and try and take players on, a bit of width. Um, and maybe you need someone next to Norwood who's probably a bit a bit like a Josh Stones was, you know, someone who's got some legs and will do a bit of running so that Norwood can concentrate on what he's best at, which is coming alive in and around the 18-yard box and, and hitting the target more often than not. Because over like five yards, he's, he's quite quick, but he's, he hasn't got a sustained burst of pace. So, you know, you've got players like that in your team that, that really you need to, you know, you, you need to build a, build a team around. Instead of, you know, when I see people, ah, oh, James Norwood, get rid of him, he's just a problem now. And I think to myself, my God, <laughs> we've probably got we've probably got one of the best strikers in the league, uh, and and people don't see that. You know, it's a bit like Will Grigg at Chesterfield. Will Grigg scored a bag lo- bag load of goals this, this season, but he's pretty much a similar sort of player, isn't he? He's a he's a penalty box footballer and um, comes alive in the box and, and scores. But they create a you know they scored over a hundred goals Chesterfield. They create a bucket load of chances for him. Mm. We create barely any for James Norwood. Anything he creates, he creates himself. Um, or you know he's you know he's he's pretty sharp from the penalty spot obviously, but we just don't we don't create enough. The, the other thing we don't do is we don't. When's the last time we scored from a corner or a free kick? You know we don't. Yeah. Our, our centre halves don't appear to score any goals. You know you, you need no I'm, to midfield score hasn't scored. No, no, the, the goals really haven't come from anywhere um, on uh, across the pitch. Have there? There's not been any variation at all. Um, so I, I mean, the, Melon's been saying there's a lot of work to do. I just don't think that you can change. You have to find a style of play that's going to complement the vast majority of the players we've got. There's not, you can't be bringing in, he's not going to be bringing in tons and tons of players. I, sh- I can't imagine unless they're able to really have a massive mass exodus this season uh, in the preseason. But if Mellon does favor a more direct style of football, do we have the players to deliver that? Start well, not ball. not at the minute. We, we don't. That, that that's part of the problem, isn't it? Because if you're lumping the ball forward and bypassing midfield and trying to pick up the second balls off, off the strikers, you know your only your only threat, aerial threat, really is is Mike Fondot, and he's probably well, he's not probably. He is the least gifted of the four four forwards we've got, um, and so you're playing a, a pretty turgid style of football where you've got to you've got to not play one of your better players in order to play that style, and and that. Just has been, just been the story of the last month. You know, he hasn't played Fondot very much. He's played his better players, and as a result of that, the style that we're playing is probably less effective. So, maybe that's been an error. Maybe he should have played someone alongside Fondot throughout that and seen how he got on. But I can and I get why he hasn't. Um, yeah, he, he, we'll get to the, you know when we do the squad pub, we'll go through it. But there's a lot of players under contract. Uh, yeah. you know, way beyond the end of the season. And there's a lot of those players that are not going to be very easy to move on. Um, yeah. You know, if you, if you have a look at some of the players that we sent out on loan, I think Joe Nuttall scored his first goal for Chest- uh, Cheltenham yesterday uh, in in a defeat away. Uh, I did see that, an interview with Dower Clark in the week where he said something about there's a player in Joe Nuttall that I've seen before and we're just trying to get it out of him. So I don't know whether they've got any designs of taking him on next season, but... I wouldn't put my house on it. He might come back. Um, mm. Kurt Willoughby's been in and out of Ayr's team. I think he's been a bit poorly. He scored two in one game and hasn't scored in any other. Uh, Brennan Dickinson played the first half dozen against the heart of the pool and had not been seen since. Don't know he's been injured. So you, there's a lot of players coming back. Some of them are out of contracts, obviously, but not all of them are. A lot of them are under contracts again. So it's going to be a tough, going to be a tough summer. Um, just, I mean, don't want to, to, obviously we'll get into the details, Andy, but like um, part of the playing budget for next season could have to be allocated to paying off certain players in the squad because at some point you've got to get rid of players in order to, to start filling the squad with, with players that you want. And there's no point we've been carrying over, like, 
I don't use what I don't like the term dead wood because I think it's a bit disrespectful to the to the lads. But the lads who don't fit in at the team, you know, we've been carrying them over. You know, some of them reminded me of Jordan Windass still on the books at Latics. Well, you know, that, 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 so that's, that's got to get, get rid. Like at some point, you've got to say, right, there's a clear, bit of a clean slate here. What so and it, that's got to come out of the playing budget, surely, in terms of saying, right, we're paying you up, you're gone. That's coming out of what you've got available for next season. Well, I, 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 if you look at if you look at the, what this board of directors has done, I don't think they. I get the impression they're not keen on paying players up. The only pay the only player we've paid up is John Rooney, and we've obviously come to an agreement with him because Macclesfield paid him something he was happy to go and pick up there. Um, but we, you know, he said Jordan Windass. We, have, we we didn't pay him up, and he can't have been on a lot of money. So I don't think, unless the player unless the player accepts terms to be paid up and go somewhere else, I don't think that we'll do that. I think that we'll transfer list a lot of players and try and ship them out on loan and see if we can get another club to pick up the bulk of the bulk of their salaries. I think otherwise, I think we're just going to be clog, you know, clogged up with a big squad. Which yeah. might hinder hinder our ability to sign players. Exactly, and the more you know, if we can't get rid of them to, to to other clubs or whatever, then there's a there's an expense to having players on the books. You've got to feed them. You've got a you know you've got to, the more staff you've got to to handle them. There's you know if they get injured in training, you've got to sort out their medical uh, expenses and whatever. So like it's. At some point, I think you've got to say, right, these lads are never going to play for us again. We've got they've got to go one way or another. We've got to free up free up the squad. So it's going to be really interesting. We'll go into it more detail uh, not next week, but the week after after the the Wheelstone game. I think yeah. that's probably when we we'll do the squad pod. But yeah, the, the, um, the other thing we've got the other thing we've got to do as well is um, uh, obviously the the club's accounts have been published. Um, we've had a we've had a good read of those, as well as a couple of other bit bits of. Sort of, you know, loose ends to tie up related to that. But I think um, you'll be more aware that the foundation have been into the club and and chatted to them about it, and and we're hoping to get the foundation on in the next week or so to have a little bit of a chat about that. And so we'll we'll put a bit of detail out. So we won't talk about it now, but put some detail out in the next couple of weeks about what that means financially, because um, you know it looked like in the year of twenty twenty two, we made a twenty two twenty three, we made a 1.7 million pound loss and that's before we signed the likes of James Norwood. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you know. so one of our representatives has, has been and sat with um the financial director at Latix and, and Darren I think it was and gone through you know the accounts in a bit more detail and there's a bit of a report being put together uh, which will be released and then obviously like I said we'll chat about it on the pod. So <laughs> yeah I mean look it, it, football and money <laughs> it's it's what it's all about. We need the we need we need money. We need to be sustainable. We need better players. More. We're going to have to keep spending, but you have to you have to start recouping the money that you're putting in. Players like Ollie Hammond. You know, you got to start be bringing players in that have some kind of potential value going forward. We can't. There's too many players that we've signed that have just got no value. Unfortunately, in this market, they're just. It's up to the. They're just draining our finances, draining our resources, and that coming back to that recruitment thing again. It's got to be smarter. It's got to be more effective. It's got to be bringing in players or bringing. We've got. You know, we're losing the academy next season. Are, are we losing it though? Well, the, you know, I was chatting to um, to a couple of the lads from the community trust the other day, and they were saying that the, the the reason that it would be gone is because effectively, once you lose, you lose the player protection. So what happens is these players, even if we kept the academy and we start keep bringing these players through, any team can come and just pick them off for nothing. Right. So you get no compensation. So basically, club like Latix is treated the same as any other grassroots club, which is ridiculous. It's a, it's a massive flaw in the, in the rules. It means mm -hmm. that clubs at our level like this can just basically become – well, we can't afford to, to to bring our own young players through, which is in even it benefits the Premier League and the football league clubs even more because they can just go around the local area just picking off all the talent um, from anywhere and, and 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 not paying for it. So you know, you, you, you look at the academy this year; they won again yesterday, I think, um, this weekend. So they they start the season uh, in difficult circumstances, and actually, uh, Chucks, who runs that team, has done really well, and they've they've ended it. You know, 
looking like there's two or three re- reasonable prospects in there. Well, you, any you prospects that they've got, any good prospects on there are going to have to get get professional contracts in order to stay at the club, yeah. and that means more professional contracts. So, like you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to decide right. Well, who's got who's got potential here? Sign them up, and then we've got to get rid of these. So that's only going to before we've released anyone. That's only going to it's in, in fact if you're looking at it from the point of view of the number of players we've got that are running out of contracts and say you're offering a virtually equal amount of youngsters professional contracts. We started off at around about that even mark anyway, before we, we even look at the players that we need to get rid of who are under contract, people like Mark Shelton and whoever else. So, like, it's, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the uh, in the closed season. Should, should, we, should we talk about, like, the, the, the longest of long shots just for a minute, just to try and uh, be a little bit positive? What happens if we win on Wednesday? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alder, Aldershot lost, didn't they? So Aldershot got beat. Halifax won it. I, I, I haven't watched Halifax, but I've heard a lot of people say they don't look very impressive in terms of you know they're, they're grinding out results, which is what we should have been trying to do. And yeah, you know, I guess they've been effective at that. But if we if we beat Halifax in the week, and if we go on a three game run where we we beat Oxford and Wealdstone, mm-hmm. then we get to seventy points. Our goal difference is better than older shots who've got a negative goal difference. And if we win all those three games, including beating Halifax, you'd assume that our goal difference might be in front of Halifax's as well. So that means that both of them would need to get to 71 points, which yeah. means which means uh, older shot would need to win two of their last three. And they're playing Gates head away. Not going to be easy. Boreham Wood at home. You might fancy him to win that, and then they've got. Well, to they're go fighting to for their lives, fighting for the lives, Boreham Wood, aren't they? They are, um, and then they've got to go to Dagenham and Redbridge last game, which you know could go either way, I guess. So it, it's yeah. not not certain that Aldershot will pick up six points from three, assuming we win all three, which I appreciate is a, long <laughs> a stretch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Halifax in their four games, they would assuming we beat them, they'd need to pick up. Uh, they need to pick up five points in order to get to seventy-one. So that'd be five points from Barnet at home. Not going to be easy. Uh, Ebbsfleet at home, you'd fancy him there. And then they've got to go to Eastleigh last game of the season. Um, so I guess it's still even now isn't all over, all over. No, no. It will be when we get beat at Halifax on Wednesday, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> look, this squad, Andy, have had ample opportunity to get themselves into the in, comfortably into the playoffs, you know, even just a few of those draws that we picked up over uh, the last month or so uh, would have would have made things a lot more comfortable for us. But you know, we we've bottled it on the big occasions. Whenever we've had a big occasion, yesterday there was a great crowd there again. Yesterday, loads of Lassitz fans turned up. Um, but there's just, I think there's. <laughs> People were turning up because it's a big game against Rochdale, knowing that there's still a possibility. But I don't. You can feel it in the ground that, they, that there's just not the expectation. It's you know something now. This season is we're all kind of a bit tired of it, and people just want to be put out of the misery because it's it's clear that we're not going to do what we're not going to win those three games and 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 get handed you know a bit of luck from the other teams around us. It's I don't think Mickey Mellon believes it. The team, I thought, had a go yesterday. I thought they had a go in the second half against Altrin, but they're just not good enough. They've just not got enough guile to break teams down. They seem to have lost all potency in front of goal. It's just completely gone. We've, we, you know, I don't know how many goals we scored in the last six, you know, seven or eight games, but it's not very many. You know, We're not scoring from open play. Um, very much scored one yesterday, but you know, like you've got to be scoring more than one goal, especially when you when you concede from set pieces like we have been doing. Like that goal against Rochdale yesterday was such a soft goal to give away again, like the one against Fylde. So you know, it's there's just too much wrong with this current team to 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 believe that we can get to to where we were, but uh, where we need to be this season. So it's it's a bit of a reset. Mark White when he came on said we were going to finish eighth. You know, we're ninth now, four points off eighth, I think it is. So, you know, well, I mean, we we should really be ten for South Point if South South End had their ten points. Yeah, back, they'd be in yeah. So they'd be yeah. in there, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. So it is what it is. 
Do you want to do elastics, mind? I, d I don't, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you'll be able to see now that there's definitely no fixing involved when I when I score none um, <laughs> on this. But, yeah, I'll give it a go. See what it's like under pressure. I, if I do really badly, I can always just delete it and just not put it in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right, okay. Here we go. Good luck to me. What colour was Latics away kit in 1996-97? Green. Correct. Who scored Latics' first goal in our 2-0 win versus Yeovil Town at Boundary Park last season? Uh, I can't even think of one player who played for those last season. That's ridiculous. Mike Fondop. Wrong. Oscar Threlkeld. <laughs> oh, yeah. How many goals did Latics concede in their title winning season of 1990 91? Uh, 49. 53. Ooh. Who knocked Latics out of the FA Cup and League Cup in the same calendar year of 1993? Tottenham. Tranmere. Which striker did Latic sign on loan from Hull City in 2009? Pass. Which defender scored a brace at Plymouth in November 2003? Um, Chris Merkin. Uh, David Beherall. <laughs> Who... Did Lat who beat Latics in the Northern Area Final of the Football League Trophy in 2011-12? Uh, Accrington, Stanley, Chesterfield. You've talked oh, about yeah. Tommy oh, Lee. Oh yeah, Tommy Lee. Oh, who, God, did, yeah. who did? Who was Latics' first choice goalkeeper at the start of 1996-97? Um, Kelly. John Hall just last week. Um, uh, which from uh, which promotion winning captain did Ronnie Moore sign as the intended mainstay of his defence in the summer of two thousand and five? Sean Gregan. It was Chris Swales. Uh, you got one. Yeah, thank God I got that first one right. Hey, it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> you got one. Uh, it, you pass, right? You have yeah. one pass. Which striker did Latic sign on loan from Hull City in two thousand and nine? He saved a penalty in goal at Leicester. Oh, Dean Windass, yeah. And we talked about his son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's re it, to be fair, it's really hard to like shuffle that information if you even knew it in the first place to the to the forefront of your brain very quickly like that. Like <laughs> so. Yeah, that's I yeah, I got one, so I'm happy enough with that. Could have it could have easily been none. Absolutely. Definitely could easily have been known. So yeah, it's all good, right? So uh, we covered the past, we covered the present, and we've touched a little bit on the future. So next week we are you've you've got a guest coming in to present with you. I'm not I'm not around next week, so you have a guest. I have, I have a guest co-host uh, yeah. who who I'll reveal next week. Right, a guest oh. co-host and and a, and a fan guest as well. Yeah, next right, week. right. So it will be um, it will either be all over or going down to the wire by that point. After freak wins at uh, Halifax and Oxford City, I mean Oxford City, you're down. That's the penultimate game of the season. I'm sure there'll be plenty of Latics fans going down to Oxford for the for the crack for the last game of the season. They may have something to play for. They may have something to some hope to hold on to, but it's looking extremely unlikely at this point. Are you looking forward to the season being over, Andy? Yeah. Are you looking forward to getting your Are you looking forward to getting your Sundays back? Yeah, it'd be nice to get my Sundays back. I've, my uh, my son starts cricket 
um, on Sunday shortly. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into the cricket season. Watch a bit of Lancashire. Go to some England games. Go and watch him play cricket. That'll be just to you know, sit in the sunshine and not have to worry. Yeah. I don't have to. I'm kind of at the point now where I'm kind of, this season's in my head to over. Yeah. And I don't really have to worry about Latics until probably, you know, after maybe half a dozen games the next season. So I've got probably until the end of September before I really need to start, you know. <laughs> Listen, unless again. unless some, some something happens over the summer and, you know, whatever, I don't know what, but you know what, it's Latics in it. So, you know, some unexpected could be around the corner but they like to think that we can that we can shut our minds off we've got the euros over the summer so there's a there's a feast of european football to watch we are distracted by other things there's no phone in this week because the halifax games on wednesday thanks for joining me this weekend uh, andy and uh, we'll see you all next week Thank you for listening to the Boundary Park Alert System, a QPod production hosted and produced weekly by Matt Dean, Andy Halliwell and Dave Bradley. QPod is Oldham's only dedicated podcast production company and if you'd like to learn more about how podcasting can help take your brand to the next level, visit kupod.co.uk. A huge thank you goes to all those people who subscribe to the podcast on Spotify. We really appreciate you all. Please visit oafcpodcast.co.uk and click Be a Supporter or find the link in the show notes if you'd like to help us fund the show it's only 2 99 per month to subscribe but if you'd rather make a one-off donation please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash oafc podcast or click the link on our website don't miss the latix football phone in every wednesday live from 8 30 p.m please visit youtube.com forward slash at oafc podcast and do hit subscribe while you are there you can also follow and interact with us on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok at oafc podcast Big thanks go to Eileen Finnegan for writing our excellent weekly blog, which we encourage you to read on our website every Saturday morning, and also to Paul Prendergast for providing us with all the Latix Mind questions. The title music for the show is by Manchester DJ and producer Starion, and for more information, visit bandcamp.com forward slash red laser records. If you'd like to be a guest or contribute to the show, we would love to hear from you. Until then, see you next time.